Finally, um, Katrina Eagle, a veterans law attorney. Good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to share my experiences and insight into the rating schedule utilized by the Department of Veterans Affairs. I am a veterans law attorney. I represent veterans, men and women veterans, and their family members here in California and across the country whose claims for service-connected disability compensation have been denied by VA. I do not work for VA. Indeed, VA is often my adversary or my opposing counsel. Still, after representing thousands of veterans for 20 years, I have acquired a working knowledge of VA's rating schedule and how it is employed in veterans' disability cases. Our country's military veterans have been compensated for their service-connected disabilities and injuries since the Revolutionary War. George Washington's well-known quote is poignant for today's discussion. The willingness with which our young people are likely to serve in any war, no matter how justified, shall be directly proportional to, as to how they, are, they perceive the veterans of earlier wars and how those veterans are treated and appreciated by their country. The same sentiment can be said for the current members of any organization, including those who work for the great state of California. The purpose behind VA's rating schedule can be summed up in two simple yet important concepts, impact on earning capacity and impact on livelihood. VA's rating system evaluates medical conditions in increments of 10%, from zero to 100%. As specifically noted in VA's regulation, the percentage ratings represent, as far as can practi practicably be determined, the average impairment in earning capacity resulting from such diseases and injuries and the residual conditions in civil occupations. In other words, it is not an all or nothing program. In a very real sense, VA disability compensation pays the veteran the difference between what he or she would be able to make if, he, if she were whole and what she is actually able to earn due to the service-connected service disability. VA's rating schedule has 14 categories of body systems. The one germane to today's discussion is gyne gynecological conditions and disorders of the breast. Within this body system, there are 19 diagnostic codes for injuries or diseases of the female reproductive organs and the breast. The rating assigned is based on its severity, as well as how much the medical condition impacts the veteran's ability to work. For many conditions, objective tests are used, such as hearing tests, x-rays, CAT scans, MRIs, etc. But for others, no such objective test exists, such as for psychiatric conditions, including depression, pain, and even tinnitus, the ringing in someone's ears. However, before VA determines what rating to assign to a veteran's medical disability, the veteran must first prove that the medical condition is related to military service. This is done by three basic criteria, being a current medical condition, something in service that is a likely cause of the current condition, and a medical nexus opinion by a medical professional that relates the current condition to military service. For example, breast cancer. A veteran would be entitled to service-connected disability compensation if she is able to show either that the cancer began during service or if the veteran was exposed to radi uh, ion uh, sorry, ionizing radiation during service, then the veteran would be entitled to compensation on a presumptive service connection basis. Other environmental toxins such as TCE, PCE, benzene are known carcinogens for breast cancer. Thus, if a veteran is able to demonstrate exposure to those such environmental toxins during military service, VA will grant connection on a direct basis. VA considers all cancers to be at 100 percent disabling and rates them as such so long as the cancer is active. Today, and the, the monthly amounts change every year by Congress's uh, doing, but right now a veteran at 100 percent rating receives approximately $3,000 a month uh, for that 100 percent rating. Whether the veteran works is immaterial. Service connection is an earned benefit and does not bar employment. The 100% rating remains in effect for six months after the cancer is removed and or remission is declared. Thereafter, VA is required to rate the residuals of both the cancer and the treatment for it. As the doctor on this panel was discussing, in the case of breast cancer, if the veteran underwent a radical mastectomy of both breasts, she would be given an 80% rating 
radical mastectomy of a one breast only requires a 50% rating. And in February 2015, VA proposed changes to the rating schedule to account for the severe residuals of breast surgeries. Breast surgery is the most common choice of treatment for benign and malignant tumors of the breast and is an established risk factor for development of scars, lymphedema, or disfigurement. These chronic residuals can cause functional impairment, such as limitation of arm and shoulder movement, as she was describing, loss of grip strength, loss of sensation, pain, and swelling. VA raters are instructed to evaluate and rate these residuals once the cancer is no longer active. VA will continue to reevaluate the residuals throughout the veteran's lifetime and either increase or decrease as the severity is shown. Uh, from a personal sp perspective, I too am a cancer survivor, not breast cancer. I had uh, Hodgkin's disease. And it's worth noting for the medical community, they are learning that more people are surviving cancer. I am one of those people that 17 years away from eight months of chemotherapy, I now suffer from prediabetes, mm -hmm. kidney dysfunction, gum disease, uh, and um, neuropathy of the hands and feet. I'm a runner. I have horrific, uh, my metabolism no longer works. I have to be on medication for thyroid dysfunction. All of that is related to the treatment of the cancer. So this is, as she was saying, something you never stop living with. Um, and it is something that the medical community is realizing the long-term effects of chemo. Chemother excuse me, chemotherapy may treat the cancer, but it does have long-term chronic effects that people who have survived cancer have to live with every day. This concludes my prepared remarks. I am happy to answer questions as they, uh, that you have, and I, again, thank you for your time. I want to thank you all. Um, I want to thank, I, I see we're joined by Assemblymember Cooley from the Insurance Committee, so I'm glad he's here as well, an expert on, helped me uh, reframe how I talked about this bill, so. Um, I do have a question. So originally in the bill that was vetoed, uh, you know, we definitely made an unscientific value-based decision that breasts should be uh, valued um, at least in the same proportions to pro men's prostate, to prostate cancer. Can you speak at all about the veterans' um, guide and how they deal with prostate as compared to, you went through the breast, but how they deal with the prostate and prostate um, cancer? Yes. Prostate cancer is, uh, is similarly rated when it is active as 100% disabling. Um, men who have gone through treatment for prostate cancer, depending upon how they respond to it, oftentimes it is uh, done with the, uh, the seeds, seed implants, and the, pro and the cancer is killed. And then it depends, they, they keep the 100% rating for six months after that treatment. And then as the veteran is undergoing uh, additional PSA tests to see what the status of the prostate levels are, um, that depends on the doctor's uh, decision as to how to proceed. There are many veterans who are in, in a state of what's called watchful waiting. They, they don't want any additional treatment. They don't require additional treatment, but the cancer itself has not been declared in remission either. It, it is either too uh, randomly spread throughout the body that it can't be treated. It's not, um, it, it's not functional or um, effective to treat it system-wide, uh, body-wide, so that they continue to watch it until it becomes a, such a high level of PSA that they have to do something else. But during... Uh, it, so, so that's 100%. Once the veteran is declared in remission, then VA again looks at all of the residuals of the prostate cancer and rates those. That includes all psychiatric disabilities, including depression, um, the sexual dysfunction, erectile dysfunction, urinary incontinence, bowel incontinence, um, and, and all of those related to that. Um, the simplest case is that a veteran that is uh, declared in remission has no residuals but has um, erectile dysfunction and and is rated zero uh, percent, but is given an additional, I believe it's $120 a month for loss of use of creative organ. And that is a result of the um, prostate cancer. So the similarity or the analogy would be in breast cancer, the woman is also, the female veteran is also compensated for loss of use of the creative organ. Um, and uh, like I said, all of the other residuals of the, the muscle, the lymphedema, the scars, uh, things like that. Does that answer? Kind of. I mean, basically, okay. it, it just depends on the severity uh, I'm understanding, um, right. and obviously, the the loss of use of a creative organ is is similarly um, positioned, correct? Right. 
and in my experience, there is not as much disparity between prostate cancer and breast cancer in VA world. In other words, what I'm understanding in, in other parts of uh, the workmen, workers' world, there is an incredible disparity. That does not exist as much, and, and I was commenting with um, Andrea yesterday, one of the reasons, unfortunately or fortunately, the reality is male veterans get breast cancer as well. Camp Lejeune, toxic water that uh, has hit the news for the last seven years. Uh, President Obama passed in 2012 the Camp Lejeune Family Act. Breast cancer is one of the 15 noted medical conditions that all veterans and the family members who served 30 days or more within a 30-month period from 1955 to 85 at Camp Lejeune, they are entitled to free health care for those 15 medical conditions. Ironically, breast cancer is not one of the presumed medical conditions for compensation purposes, but with the right medical nexus opinion, I represent many veterans with esophageal cancer, breast cancer, colon cancer, all of those that you can show are related to TCE, PCE, benzene exposure. So I believe that one of the reasons that the disparity is not as great in VA world is that men have breast cancer as well, especially that is one of the, that is actually one of the cancers that drove the um, spotlight on Camp Lejeune was men with breast cancer. It was a high rate of male breast cancer from Camp Lejeune, and that started asking a lot of questions. I think. Yes, I apologize. I'm going to have to leave, but this is really fascinating to me. I am also a breast cancer survivor. I have BRCA1 gene, nine years. Uh, so I get what you're talking about quite personally. Um, I, I'm interested um, in a couple things, and I think your next panel might address this. You're talking about dealing with the patients, dealing with the conditions. That now, now what we have to do as lawyers and all as, and as legislators and policymakers is figure out how the how this translates into our workers' comp system. Clearly, in your this vet system, I think you're much more egalitarian uh, for whatever reason. Uh, which is good that you are and bad that we're seeing so many cancers coming from situations that are arguably preventable. Um, but a couple things that I'd like to ask to be discussed going forward. One is the psych we're talking about the psychiatric and psychological consequences. You know, there's lymphedema, uh, there's scarring, there are these physical things, but, but there is a lot, because for whatever reason, you know, breasts are very heavily valued in our society and in some instances one could argue required. Um, for women to uh, feel like they're women. But I don't sense that when we're looking at workers' comp, those psychological impacts are addressed. So I'd like somebody to talk about that in the next panel. And also, um, you mentioned you're 17 years out of treatment. I'm nine years out of treatment. My understanding is there's, you know, thank God we're still alive. So we're all grateful for this. But um, as we're able to cure and remission cancers more effectively, more people are living longer. And then the question becomes, what are those long-term impacts of radiation and chemotherapy and God only knows what else that, that you take while you're going through this process to save your life? So here we are. Are there studies being done? And if so, are they being incorporated into the workers' comp program as we identify these long-term impacts that occur as a result of cancer treatment, whether it's two years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago? Because those are the kinds of things, if we really want to be um, uh, medically specific and scientific, we should be uh, considering when we consider workers' comp uh, results as well. So I, it, I have staff here that are going to take notes, and I apologize. I'm supposed to be in another committee, but this is – thank you for being here. Thank you for what you're doing. Um, you know, very interesting. We all – we used to say, if it wasn't you, we all know somebody. Um, who's gone through this, and uh, uh, certainly we all do, and then when you've gone through it yourself, it becomes really quite personal. So thank you very much for, for your testimony and for being here. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to say that, um, you know, as, as more men and women survive breast cancer, the long-term effects of therapy, uh, not only long-term but late effects, as you had mentioned, radiation, <laughs> diagnosing, you know, I just saw a woman who had radiation 15 years ago, and now she has an angiosarcoma of her uh, skin along that chest wall, which is, it's rare, but it happens. And so I think that's an important issue to bring up when we talk about the disability and, and making sure that that's being considered, and I don't know if that is. 
one, one part related to what um, Assemblymember Jackson was saying is, Senator, Senator I'm sorry, Senator Jackson. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, is that women that are treated with radiation treatment, such as I was, and by the way, I'm one with lymphedema, um, they, it gets them through the breast cancer, but then they have a much, much higher of suffering a heart attack 25 years later if it's on the left side. But they don't tell you that. You know, immediately when you're diagnosed with breast cancer, it's just, let's deal with the cancer. They don't, the long-term sequelae isn't really looked at. Thank you. I don't know. I know we were joined by Assemblymember Dolly. I want to thank you for coming. We, we didn't mean to put all the men on one side. <laughs> <laughs> Again, um, showcasing the bipartisan nature of um, both when this bill went through as well as this ongoing issue. I thank you for being here. I want to thank all the panelists. Um, it's clear to me today, you know, we're we may not get to a scientific answer of, of the value of a breast, but it's clear that there are different ways to value it, that, that, that it's much more complex perhaps than um, whether somebody can golf or do light housework, um, and that there, there are many facets to this, and I think you all did a very good job of highlighting that. If you have written testimony, we will accept it. Obviously, we're going to put a report out from this, okay. so we and, and hopefully um, to get the, the governor's office to take a look at all the uh, multifaceted approach. And I want to thank you all for coming and sharing um, yours as well. Do you have a question, Melissa? You know, I apologize, Madam Chairwoman. I just wanted to add something. Um, I, I think you highlighted what we were suggesting earlier in that uh, when it become, when a woman's issue becomes a man's issue, suddenly people pay attention. And you mentioned that once men started coming down with breast cancer from Camp Lejeune experience, that suddenly people became alarmed. And I think that just proved the point very succinctly and clear. So I want to thank you for pointing that out. You're welcome. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Our um, next panel uh, is, is uh, about the practice of assigning value. So uh, we are going to have Crystal Schoenfelder, Schoenfelder um, talking about the disability ratings for breast cancer in the workers' compensation system. Um, Janice Page uh, with the workers' compensation experience as a survivor. Um, and Sue Borg um, talking about our decision to rely on the AMA guide. We will start with Crystal. Chair Gonzalez, wherever she went, She'll and committee right members yeah. and assembly member Cooley. I'm Crystal Schoenfelder, president elect of the California Applicants Attorneys Association, known as CAW, and I'm chair of CAW's Women's Caucus. Thank you for allowing me to testify this morning and for calling attention to the plight of California's injured women. California's workers' compensation system can be a demoralizing, mentally taxing, and frustrating system for many injured workers to navigate. Delays and denials of medical treatment, employer or coworker harassment, job loss, and loss of private health insurance, not to mention lifelong pain and emotional and physical scars after a work injury. And on top of all this, the state of California tells a postmenopausal firefighter exposed to toxins, a farm worker exposed to chemicals, and a nurse working with the night shift that removal of their breasts due to cancer from their jobs is worth nothing. But a 55-year-old male firefighter who has his prostate removed due to cancer from exposure to toxic chemicals on the job will receive approximately $35,000 for removal of his prostate plus additional compensation if he suffers from incontinence and or sexual dysfunction. This gender bias and mar marginalization of women's anatomy cannot be tolerated. Chair Gonzalez tried to remedy the bias last legislative session with AB 305. Unfortunately, Governor Brown vetoed that bill, and you heard earlier his message. Chair Gonzalez does not misunderstand the AMA guides. Rather, she understands and recognizes that there is a gender bias built into the AMA guides and the standard must change. It is Governor Brown who misunderstands current workers' compensation law. And by vetoing the bill, he is perpetuating bias against injured women. 
The Senate analysis of AB 305 incorrectly states that removal of the prostate is only rated 16 to 20 percent if the prostate removal led to sexual dysfunction or urinary incontinence, but this is simply not true. The AMA guide says prostate and seminal vesicle ablation rates 16 to 20 percent. It is the procedure of removing the prostate that rates 16 to 20 percent, regardless of whether there are any sexual or incontinence consequences. The guides then provides additional compensation for sexual dysfunction or urinary incontinence. So simply put, the procedure of removing the, pres the prostate is 16 to 20 percent, while the procedure of removing the breasts is 0% if postmenopausal and up to 5% if of childbearing age. This is the problem. Removal of a piece of a woman's body is worth less than the removal of a piece of a man's body. The Senate analysis contends that if women are in pain post mastectomy, they could obtain a rating through the AMA Guides chapter on pain. However, the Senate analysis fails to mention that the most a woman could get for a pain rating is 3%. The Senate analysis concludes that, quote, the male prostate is not a strong equivalent to female breasts, end quote, and implies that prostate cancer is more severe than breast cancer. The tone of the Senate analysis is exactly why a change in workers' compensation law is needed. And some online industry comments are just plain callous on this issue, saying a woman should not receive compensation for breast removal unless she is an exotic dancer or lingerie model. Another post said scarring or pigmentation would be the residual minor disability at Mardi Gras or the beach. One post said loss of a breast probably enhances your ability to do numerous functions. And another post said loss of breasts, in fact, can increase a woman's range of motion. It's unbelievable, but these are real posts. Permanent disability compensation for a work injury is no longer tied to loss of capacity for work, as you heard Julius um, earlier talk about. It does seem un irrational, but it is the current law since 2004. So anyone who says that loss of breasts doesn't affect the ability to work, hence there's no compensation, simply doesn't understand today's California system. And anyone who says the rating for prostate cancer is currently higher than breast cancer because of a more drastic effect on activities of daily living doesn't understand the prostate rating currently in the AMA guides. According to the University of Chicago Medical Center website, their, quote, prostate cancer experts describe a focal prostate laser ablation therapy as being similar in concept to a lumpectomy for breast cancer. So if a focal prostate ablation is equivalent to a lumpectomy, it makes complete sense then to reason that prostate removal is similar and akin to breast removal. And the procedures should receive equal compensation in the workers' compensation system. Codifying a specific fair analogy between prostate and breast cancer would eliminate the increased frictional costs and especially protect unrepresented injured women. Additionally, it would benefit the rare cases of men who get breast cancer from their jobs. We must take care of Californians injured on the job and ensure California's mothers and daughters receive compensation equal to California's fathers and sons. Thank you. Thank you. My, my favorite testifier. Yeah. <sighs> you want to go ahead and start? Sure. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Janice Page. I'm a law enforcement sergeant, and I've been a peace officer for over 15 years. I love my job, and I'm proud to serve and protect the public. I have worked patrol, corrections, transportation, and specialized units during my career. As a first responder, my job has involved responding to a variety of calls. These calls have involved vehicle accidents, where at times these vehicles are on fire. Other emergency responses in have involved house fires, commercial structure fires, and gasoline fires. All these incidents include smoke and fumes. I remember responding to a call of a prowler where we discovered a gas leak. On February 2nd of 2012, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. I've had a total of five surgeries within 18 months, developed infections, and I've had a breast removed. The cancer was determined to be work-related. I have returned to my job, but life has not been the same. The loss of my breast has been devastating. 
Although I have an implant, it's not the same. There is nothing normal about living without your breath. I have left with no feeling in my right breast. It is scarred and my body is now missing an important organ. In addition to the physical changes, it has been very difficult emotionally. It has, me, has made me feel difficult about myself. When I started out, I had two normal looking breasts. Now I have one normal and one that is deformed. My right breast is higher and smaller than my left. It has not only been left scarred, but it is now distorted in shape. I am embarrassed by my appearance and upset at having to have a part of my body removed. I have filed a claim for workers' compensation insurance to provide medical care and compensation for my permanent disabilities. The law requires insurance companies to compensate me for permanent disabilities resulting from my injury. Although nothing can make up for a loss of the body part, there should be compensation for the result impact on my life. But I was given a permanent impairment rating of 0% by my treating doctor. With the 0% rating, the insurance would pay no permanent disability compensation for the loss of my breasts. If a male officer had a similar loss of one of his organs, say his prostate to cancer, the rating would be closer to 16%. Does that seem fair? I should not be discriminated against and have my disability compensation reduced because of a bias against women. I carry the same weight on my duty belt as my male colleagues, confront the same dangers, work just as hard, and it is not fair for me and my fellow female officers to be penalized because of our gender. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Sue Borg, and I'm a, a certified workers' comp specialist, and I had the great pleasure of representing Janice Page, who came to me outraged when she received a 0% rating on her treating doctor's report. So in the end, after probably a year and a half or two years of litigation where Janice had to take time off to come to my office. She had to take time off to go to court on several occasions. We spent probably two or three hours on the day of trial thinking we were going to trial until at the last minute um, we did come to a settlement that in our minds was reasonable and comparable to what a man probably would have gotten in a prostate case. So it's not that it's impossible to achieve that rating, but the costs to the injured worker are substantial. The costs to the system are substantial. This was an accepted injury. There were no disputes. And yet she had to come into my office with a 0% rating that is disrespectful to her and to everyone here, I think. You, we can, in a particular situation, go to various parts of the AMA guides under caseload, case law that we have available to try to piece together a rating that's more accurate. However, this is time consuming, and it also does not take into effect all the the ramifications of this injury. For example, many of the psychological effects that were mentioned in a prior panel, for us to actually get a psychiatric rating in this case means we have to now prove an injury or a compensable consequence that for some, for some years you can't even have a compensable consequence psychiatric injury unless you could show that the injury was catastrophic I don't think we know yet whether this would be considered catastrophic or not. We would have to also deal with a burden of proof that is substantially higher in a psychiatric case. And you would be forcing a safety officer or a nurse or another survivor of cancer to have to lay out all these things on the table when a man would not have to do the same thing. It's simply inequitable and unfair that in a system that is designed for injured workers to be taken care of without lawyers, 
that someone like Janice Page and many, many others need to go out and find a lawyer in order to get anything resembling fair treatment, and that is at a great cost. Thank you, and Janice, I know I feel like I've made you tell your story so many times, but I want to thank you. It's so compelling. And just to be clear, um, I'm going to open up to questions, but this is uh, not a, a question of presumption for peace officers, firefighters. This presumption exists. If you get breast, breast cancer, they're going to presume it's from the job. So it is just an issue of um, compensation um, for those, just in the same way that prostate cancer is a presumption uh, for male officers in the same situation. So it's the outcome that we're really looking at. So thank you again. I'm sorry. Someday we won't make you retell your story. I hope. Um, maybe we'll make you retell it to the governor himself. That could be interesting. So I think Ms. Melinda. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, can anyone answer for me do we know the percentage of American males who um, come down with prostate cancer compared to the number of females who come down with breast cancer. Just, it's not a, just wondering if, okay, I'm just curious to see what the numbers are. Um, and the percentages that you spoke of, the 0% for breast cancer and the, I believe at, at a minimum 5% for prostate cancer, 16, that's the minimum? The, All right, 16 to 20% for the ablation remo removal so, of the prostate. So I'm just, I just want to be clear. Um, so is that the case every time it's always going to be 0% for breast cancer and it's always going to be the 16% for prostate cancer? Well, as I mentioned, that we have some case law that allows us to... Absent going to court. Absent going to yes. court, the doctor is going to describe a, a whole person impairment based on the strict guidelines of the AMA guides. And so the answer is so the yes. answer is yes, unless it will always the be zero percent uh, absent the what unless you had the to doctor do. has a level of sophistication to describe some of these additional impacts right. using other chapters in the AMA guides. And in my experience, that's rare without me having to go in there and ask the questions. Okay. This is a copy of the page of the AMA guides. So this is the section that is the table criteria for rating permanent impairment due to prostate and seminal, seminal vesicle disease. And there are three different classes based on what the condition and or the symptoms are. So class three has a specific percentage range, which is the 16 to 20 percent that corresponds with the removal okay. of the prostate. Okay. If my recollection serves me, I'm not, I think that the treating doctor in Janiska's case, or maybe it's another case, um, felt not right about assigning a 0%, but felt that their hands were tied. Felt because compelled this because is, of the guide. This is the guide. Right. I, I understand. Okay. Yeah. I just want to be clear on that. That's just very curious to me that that would be the presumption that, that it would always be 0%. It's which presumed is, that the guides are accurate right. well, unless proven otherwise. Again, I go back to my statement earlier that women, when it comes to your health, you, you have to you know, beg, scratch, and fight for it, or no one's going to do it for us. So we're willing to do that. Thank you. Excellent. Mr. Coley. I don't have questions as much as just observations. I'm very appreciative of you convening this hearing, and I've appreciated listening to all the witnesses, this panel, the prior panels. I'm sorry I got got here late. Um, and I'll more direct this conversation to my colleagues a little bit. Um, you know, I think there are just an abundant number of issues in California that have suffered as a consequence of 20 years of very short term limits as affecting this body, the assembly. Six years is too short to develop a depth of understanding of the subject matter. With respect to workers' comp, um, the AMA guides are sort of surrogate. They, they, they are used as a way to kind of figure out what the applicable rules are. But I think as legislators, what we always know is that is actually simply a delegation of legislative authority. We, we confer to some outside organization in a variety of areas where they're deemed to have relevant expertise. And we have ceded legislative authority. So I think 
This conversation is all about how does the legislature take this long established right. The workers' compensation system was adopted in California in 1913. So the year we, were, we took office and really got going was the century mark of the workers' comp system. And uh, we do have this guaranteed right, and it is incumbent upon, I think, legislators, you know, our motto in the chambers upstairs, the duty of the legislature to pass just laws, to try to own this sort of thing and look at how do the rules work. Insofar, in, in prior legislative sessions, a uh, delegation of legislative authority has hacked acted with respect to the AMA. You can sort of understand the political dynamics of that, but uh, I think this is a very important hearing to kind of focus attention upon a justice issue which should concern all 80 members of the assembly. People are busy today. We have multiple responsibilities. I have another hearing I should be at, but I sort of feel I'm the insurance expert, so probably to sit in this room is important to be supportive of my colleagues. Um, you know, in my, earlier in my career, I was chief counsel of the old Finance Insurance Committee during an epic working through the workers' comp system. This was the late 1980s. And um, even then, you saw the legislature approaching it. We had a, in those days, my committee actually had a workers' comp subcommittee that was focused on the general topic. It took a considerable period of time to work through the work we did in that era. But so, I, Mr. Page, I very much honor you for coming here. Um, I, I'm pretty open about this. I have had a pacemaker for 21 years. So I actually know the experience of, of not feeling comfortable laying down and, and that sort of thing. It's like that's a personal thing to me. That was sort of where I walked in. That was uh, Cass Capel, I think, made that remark. So uh, I was sort of into the subject matter as soon as I walked in the room, sort of hearing people recount how this affects their lives. And um, so I just think, you know, the governor can express the governor, but he sort of went back to the AMA and his view of the AMA, but it is the job of the legislature to set the law. This is a complex area. Workers' comp goes through our entire system, but it, it is our job to kind of determine what the law is and if there is to be a delegation and if we want to impose some limitations or criteria upon that delegation. So that's our office. So I'm very grateful for this hearing. So thank you. I do have one question, uh, just some backup questions. Um, at what, it, was it during the Schwarzenegger reforms that the AMA guide was determined to be the best fit? Yes. That, that was, it was adopted at that time. And, and at that time, like now, there could be a variety of best fits. We could have chosen the veterans um, guide of. I'm sure, I'm sure there were probably others. Plus up until that time, California had their own permanent disability rating schedule that was designed here for us. Under that rating, was breast cancer given a different rating than? <clears throat> no, that whole system was completely different and was it, it wasn't based on loss of use of body parts like the AMA guides was. So I don't know that there was a specific um, rating for breast cancer. So the AMA guide, uh, was it considered the most scientific uh, value or was it a, con I, I, I wasn't here, so I'm not sure um, our, our decision, it seems. Well, I don't think our group <laughs> yeah. the most um, scientific. And I don't believe that the AMA guides itself considers itself scientific. It is a series of consensus-based articles that are different from chapter to chapter. So I think if you look at the, the AMA guides and how they talk about it, they don't really talk about being evidence-based. So if, um, if because I, I think the governor's own words was we were um, introducing an unscientific standard to suggest that breast cancer should be rated the same as prostate cancer. And I, I agree that that's an unscientific value-based decision that could be seen as slightly um, random but equitable in our system. Um, but you would suggest that the AMA it, guide itself has never um, has never been promoted as a scientific based uh, 
In document. my opinion, it's not a scientific based, and I don't believe it holds itself out in that way, even. Thank you. I was just to say, I mean, I think in the law, a delegation of legislative authority, you have to have an entity which is known to have a reputation, a sort of professional reputation, expertise in an area that they apply their expertise sort of in a non-biased manner within their system. So we have, you know, we go to, uh, um, in the realm of insurance law generally, we often delegate to the National Association of Insurance Commissioners, which promulgates model statutes and laws. We have uh, organizations that uh, accredit universities. They're not really seen to have a, a you know, an ax to grind, they accredit universities, we delegate to them. So I think this would be a case of a well-known organization, undeniable medical expertise in the tug of war over how the workers' compensation system works, looking to find some sort of touchstone for decisions, looking at the entirety of injuries. That is seen as a, a reasonable place to go. Uh, you know, if we're dealing with kids, it might be the American Academy of Pediatrics. But I more make the point as a lawyer, as a state legislator with my colleagues, the 80 members of this house can come together and enunciate what we believe are the applicable principles for California law, and we may maintain that delegation in many respects. But we can still come forward and say we think that there's a, a reason that the, there's, it's subject to some adjustment for rational period, and I would say that is our responsibility, we take that oath uh, to be open to exercising our authority and perspective. Uh, a delegation has been granted, we can, you know, our job actually, the whole oversight conversation, how is the law being implemented? Do we agree with how it's being construed? Is there changing facts, circumstances, insights that prompt an adjustment to our understanding of the law and the statutes that support it? That's, you know, that's inherent in our office. So. Pardon me, Madam Chair. No, I always appreciate your perspective on this. You've helped me um, understand it even better. Uh, at this point, I want to thank the panelists, and I want to go ahead and, um, like every committee hearing, ensure that we, we have some public comment. If there's any desire for public comment, we can take it um, right here at the front, actually. Is there any? Seeing none, um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, close out this select committee on women in the workplace. I want to thank all the panelists and all the participants. I'm hopeful we can um, bring together a, a report, maybe clarifying as we reintroduce this bill um, to ensure that gender bias does not uh, continue to uh, to put women in the workplace at a disadvantage when it comes to workers' compensation and injuries in the workplace. Uh, it's, I think, unfortunate. We have to have a hearing to, it might be the first, hopefully, uh, for over an hour, discuss um, what's for women, I think, so often is so obvious to us, the fact that um, for us to have a value of more than 0%, um, even, a little bit more, I guess, if you're breastfeeding, I would even suggest the 5% for a breastfeeding woman is low. Um, it, there's an intrinsic value uh, whether or not a woman is of age to breastfeed. So um, thank you all for, for contributing to that conversation. We hope uh, to continue to garner support as once again we bring this bill through the legislature.